I have to uh, deal with this tendency in my life, and uh, I want people to like me. I tend to want people to think that I'm cool, or I'm articulate, or I'm important to them. Sound familiar, all you people who just raised your hand? I am not one of those people who naturally says, I don't care what people think. So I have to fight to stay grounded in who I am in Christ and what God says is true about me. So this becomes really funny this week and yet sobering as I preach today because the passage we're going to study does not hold out the prospect of huge success. At least in terms of the numbers of people who will be lastingly affected by the teaching of the Word of God today. As we'll see, the success rate today might be as low as 25%. Now, it could be that uh, God is at least giving pastors a warning from being cocky so that we don't think that we can change people easily. Or to keep us from becoming discouraged because there are many hearers who don't respond with lasting change. I uh, gained some solace by reading Charles Spurgeon, who was the great English preacher in the mid to uh, late 1800s. He was dubbed the Prince of Preachers. And this is what he said. Now remember, he was English in the 1800s, so work with me here. Our duty as preachers is not measured by the character of our hearers, but by the command of our God. We are bound to preach the gospel whether men will hear or whether they will reject it. It is ours to sow beside all waters. Let men's hearts be what they may. The minister must preach the gospel to them. He must sow the seed on the rock as well as the prepared dirt, on the highway as well as the plowed field. And that's what we're going to strive to do today in this passage in Luke 8. So uh, here, here today, if you're here at uh, Gehanna or at our Whitehall campus, I'd encourage you to take your Bible and pull it out and turn to Luke chapter 8. Maybe open your app up. Your insert is also in your worship folder this morning with all of the passages and some notes you can follow along on. We're going to look at the passage that Christopher just read for us. Often known and uh, marked in your Bible as the parable of the sower. And I'd suggest that this is really the parable of the soils because it's all about dirt. Okay? And uh, so we're going to jump right in. We're going to kind of take a step back. We started last weekend on Easter looking at the parables. We looked at the parable of the sons. Today we're going to look at this parable of the soils, what we're calling today dirt. Let's go back, though, and kind of determine why Jesus used parables or these stories. In verse 1 of chapter 8, it says that Jesus was proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. That was the purpose of the parables. The purpose of Jesus' ministry was to proclaim and bring the good news or the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's been said that parables are stories of everyday life that illustrate spiritual truths. And what would happen in them is that as this spiritual truth was given, it would either illuminate or it would close spiritual eyes. Now that may not make sense. We're going to talk about that some more here in a few minutes. Luke tells us how Jesus explained the purpose of parables in this situation in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 8. It says, when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, in other words, we're confused, we think we're confused, we're not sure, we want to make sure what this parable means, Jesus said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a shocking word to me. Understanding the king, kingdom of God on one hand, that makes sense. It's a free gift of God for those whom Jesus has chosen as his disciples. But then he says that for others... The reason for his parables, the reason he's going to talk in these stories is so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. So Jesus was preaching so that people would not understand. It'll make sense in a minute. Don't worry about it. The issue here is hearing. It's hearing again. This means that there are two kinds of hearing. One with the physical ears that we hear. 
Most of us have, you know, we got these things on the side of their ears that, of course, as we get older, they don't work near as well as they used to, but they're still working okay. And then the one with spiritual ears, there are ears in our heart, ears of our soul that we hear with, that we take in the truth. In other words, the parables are a part of Jesus, now listen carefully, Jesus concealing and hardening ministry as well as his revealing and saving ministry. Let me say that again. The parables are not just part of Jesus' revealing and saving ministry where people understand the word, understand the truth of the gospel and the word of God. They are part of his ministry of concealing and hardening of people. Jesus is saying that there are those who will hear the truth and say, this makes no sense to me at all while there are others who will hear and understand what he calls the mysteries of the kingdom. See, in any given room, on any given Sunday, where someone is teaching or preaching, there are those of us who will understand the truth. The Holy Spirit will work in our lives and in our hearts, and we will understand and many times be convicted and will make change because of that. In the same room, sitting right next to that person, maybe someone else, who says, this makes no sense to me at all. See, it's being hidden, it's being concealed, and they're, in reality, hardening to the truth of the Word of God. What's being described here is this hardening. There is a, this is the distinction between believers and unbelievers, is it not? To those who follow Jesus and those who do not. Those who are softened to the truth of the gospel and those who are hardened to the truth of the gospel. Ephesians 4.18 says, Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. Acts 28.27 says, For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Now, interestingly enough, this passage in Luke, where Jesus makes this statement, is specifically a quote from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 10. It is Isaiah's commission from the Lord. And the Greek version of this says this, and he said, this is God speaking to Isaiah, go and say to this people, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear and they have closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. So the gospel, like Isaiah's message, is paradoxical in its effect. Do you see this? It has two impacts, two very different impacts. The prophetic word closes the way of God. It closes the way of God to those who are rebellious and proud and hypocritical and who do not see their need for a Savior, but it opens it up to the deaf and the blind and the humble and the poor, those who see that they have a need for the Savior. Two things at any given moment are happening. They're happening at the same time. They happen in this room on Saturday at 6 and Sunday at 9 and 11. There are two kinds of hearing going on. Those who will hear and take it in and see our need for a Savior, who, who continue to grow in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and those who will be closed off and who are hardened. So the important question for each of us is this. How am I hearing today? How am I hearing today? Well, that's the purpose of Jesus' parables. And then let's look next at what the purpose of this specific parable is. We see that in verses 4 and 11. First of all, it's interesting to note this is a parable that's found in three out of the four Gospels. So it's important. We can assume that as we've seen his purpose, overall, the general purpose, is to identify those who hear the truth and those who do not, right? We know that. He's speaking a parable. Okay, what do we know first? This is going to separate his audience. 
between those who are going to accept the truth and those who will not, who will reject it. So while the general purpose of the principles is to enlighten or conceal, this parable reveals to us the details of how that takes place. It's, it is singular in the parables of taking that general idea and specifically bringing it to a point where we see how that takes place. How does this, this hardening or this, this acceptance of the gospel, whichever it may be, happen? We see that confirmed in verse 11. The issue is again hearing. How do you hear the preaching of the word of God? How do you, when you're sitting under teaching, listening to somebody, in other words, what are you thinking right now? Other than, I wish he would stop doing or saying whatever. Okay? What, what, are you, what are you thinking right now? Where is your mind right now? What are you hearing? Well, the purpose of this parable is to narrow this idea of explaining to us the specifics of how that happens. It's important to see who this parable is for. Verses 2 through 4 tell us who's present for this teaching, specifically in Scripture at this point in time. It is Jesus' followers, his disciples, those who have been impacted by his ministry. It's also the crowd we see in verse 4, the crowd who had come to hear him. This isn't a random crowd in a town. These are those who specifically have come to hear Jesus teach. And he's speaking to and about, we'll call them the gathered, those, those who have come for the purpose of hearing Jesus teach. In other words, this is about us today. You're sitting here listening to the word of God preached, hopefully in a way that's being done fairly well. And you and I would have been the ones sitting and listening to Jesus. We've come here for whatever reason this morning. Maybe somebody made you come. Maybe somebody sitting on that hillside listening to Jesus. You know, their mom made them come too. So you're in good company, okay? But we gather together each weekend for this purpose. Today, this would be us. Those of us who on any given weekend are sitting in this place, listening to the word of God be taught and preached. So this isn't all, to all those horrible sinners out there. Jesus isn't talking outside the walls. He's talking inside the walls. This is to us. Those of us who sit and listen each week. Well, just to clarify, one thing we've already said, we want to just, I just want to make sure you got it, is what this parable is about. The very last part of verse 8 tells us as we've already seen, it's about hearing. This is a parable about hearing, and yet it is a parable about not hearing. Seeing, and yet not seeing. It's about those who think they have heard, but they haven't heard. Now, as parents, we know this, right? The ultimate proof of hearing is what? Obedience. <laughs> okay? I was never sure that my sons were hearing what I said until the trash was actually at the street, right? That's the ultimate proof of hearing. It's obedience, right? What we are doing with the truth that we hear. What is our response to the gospel? It's going to show up. At the end of verse 8, Jesus makes sure we get the point about hearing, and he says this. And it says, while he was speaking, he cried out. It's a very interesting passage. He cried out. So somewhere in the midst of the message, you can see Jesus just, okay, he's just teaching, and all of a sudden he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now maybe he did that because somebody had fallen asleep and he saw them. Right? Somebody's dozing off, so he's preaching along. He's saying, this is a message about hearing. He who has ears, let him hear. And they woke up and he could go on. I, you know, I'm just speculating. Not that anyone would ever fall asleep in church. Never happens. That's why we don't have a choir anymore. So you don't get to watch people fall asleep. <laughs> he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This means it's not enough to just say I'm here and I'm listening. There's another kind of ear that only some people have. Those that can truly hear. There is a spiritual ear, an ear that hears in the preaching of the word more than mere words. There's a beauty and a truth and a power that these ears hear is compelling, that is transforming, that is preserving. 
That's the kind of hearing Jesus is calling for. Hearing that brings obedience. Specifically, this parable explains why this message has different effects on different people. It's not that the message is defective, defective, right? We know that when the gospel is preached, some people accept it and others do not, correct? Some people just make no sense. And as a believer, you wonder, why is this not making sense to you? Well, it's not the message that is defective or that some people just get it and not others. The message is the message of the gospel. The issue is that many people fail to experience the life-changing power of God's message because they don't respond to it in a life-giving way. It's about the response. Now, just to help you understand this, I was going to actually put these up here, but I thought this might be dangerous because I would have needed two stoves and two pots of boiling water. So just for the sake of anyone who might come up and, you know, little kids, we don't want that tipping over on them, okay? So on this side, we're going to have a pot of boiling water, and on this side, we're going to have a pot of boiling water, okay? And I've got two things in my hand. I'm going to, I know, try to work with me, okay? In this pot, I'm going to put an egg, okay? We're going to drop it into the boiling water, and on this side, I'm going to drop a potato. Same water, correct? Same water. What effect does boiling water have on the egg? It hardens it, right? Okay, it hardens it. Now let's go over here to the potato, see how it's doing. What impact is the boiling water having on the potato? It's softening it. Is the issue the water? No. The issue is what went into the water. Okay? Same water, same boiling point, two different impacts. A softening and a hardening. Okay? This is what the gospel does. This is what the truth of the Word of God does. It can soften or it can harden depending on what's hearing, what's being affected by it, correct? Okay, makes sense? So real quick, what's what in this parable? Hopefully we've already answered this question, but let's make sure we know. What's what? The sower. Who's the sower? He's only mentioned one time, okay? So that's why it's not the parable of the sower, There's this guy, you know, there's somebody who's throwing seed, got to happen. The sower is the person who is preaching, who is teaching, who is sharing the word of God, sharing the gospel, okay? Then there is the seed. This is mentioned a few times. The seed, we're told, is the word of God, the truth, the gospel. Later on, we'll see, as we look specifically into the pieces of the parable, Jesus says the seed is the word of God. It's the clearest thing in the entire parable. And then the soils, which is what this parable is about, is different kinds of hearing. These are people who hear the truth in different ways. Well, we're going to go to the end of this passage in verse 18, and I want to challenge you with what it says, so that as we go through the parable, you're challenged to see this and hear this in a certain way. Okay, so this is a challenge for each of us sitting right here, right now. Verse 18, take care then how you hear. For the one, to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. If you have ears to hear, if you have a good and honest heart, then you will be given understanding, and you will be given a life of fruitfulness, we'll see. But if you do not have ears to hear, and don't have good soil, then even what you think you have will be taken away. See, this is a huge issue. Salvation hangs on what we're going to talk about this morning. Because this passage starts to reveal those who believe they are following Jesus who really aren't. Those who think that the seed of the gospel has taken root, and it really hasn't. Hearing is a high calling. It doesn't come naturally. It is a gift, but it can be sought. Look what Jesus says in verse 18. Take heed how you hear. In other words, pay attention to how you're hearing. Seems to me he's saying this can 
change. You can hear a certain way. You can choose to hear the truth or choose to not hear the truth. There are two parts here. Whoever has, okay, there's a positive part. Whoever has, to him more shall be given. And there's also a negative. Whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away from him. As we're going to see in just a minute, but I want you to know ahead of time what we're looking for. The point of this verse is to interpret what happens in the four soils. Because three times, we're going to look at four different soils, three times this comes true. In three of the soils, what happens is whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. Where the impact of the seed, the gospel, is taken away. But one time in the fourth soil, the opposite comes true. Whoever has, to him, more shall be given. If you hear with a good and honest heart, aware of your own sinfulness, we see that in verse 15, then more will be given to you. So let's take care, care how we hear. For all of us listening to the word this morning, let's make sure we are choosing to hear. Four ways to hear the word of God. Let's get right into the parable now. I think we've taken time to kind of set this up, really see what it is we're going to be talking about. So there's this sower, and he's sowing seed, and he's going through his field. Now the fields probably weren't the same as they are now. If we drive out more Road and see those fields, this is not probably what we're talking about in the first century. Probably talking about ones that still had rocks in them, and they were hilly. They didn't have the kind of machinery to level off. There's probably actually paths that people would use and they'd kind of, you know, trample down certain portions of, the, of these fields because that was their way of, of transport. They'd walk and, you know, you can see oxen and all these kind of things going over these paths and through these fields. So the first one is the path. So we're sowing the seed. We know that the seed is the what? The Word of God, okay? Verse 8, Jesus says, some of this seed fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And then in verse 12, unlike Jesus typically does with his parables, he takes the time here to tell everyone what the parable means. Okay, verse 12. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they might not believe and be saved. These are people who are hearers only. These are, they don't believe. They enjoy hearing the gospel preached. There may be some here today who you come each week and you, you kind of like being here and for, you know, there's something about preaching and teaching that you enjoy and it makes you feel good and so you come. You enjoy hearing it preached, but... You're you're a hearer only. There's no real belief. It never invades you. And the truth never changes you. This is a hearing where Satan takes away the word. This person would believe that they have the word, but the devil snatches it away. The word of the gospel lies on a surface. The surface of the heart, it never really enters in. Pastor Steve often tells us that's the difference between here and here, right? Right? Sometimes it's an 18-inch difference between what we know or say we believe and what we truly believe. The truth never takes root. Never really even has even the slightest impact. See, this listener, this hearer is the person who will go back to your house today and you'll most likely forget what God has said to you. You know, it's just kind of sat there on the pavement. And the birds are going, we can get that stuff. The enemy sends thieves along and just takes it away. You know, how well do you remember the words of the sermon on Monday? The evil one comes along and entices you with sin and the desires of the flesh and it takes over. Monday hits and it's right back to the the grind. 
You forget because it occupies just an hour or so of your mind once a week. You feel good after going to church, and then you go right back to life thinking nothing of what happened on Sunday. This is the churchgoer. Remember, he's talking to who? Us sitting here, right? This is the churchgoer with nothing more than self-serving religiosity and self-reliance for the needs of life. That an hour and a half on a Sunday is just part of the ritual of the week. It isn't about worship. It isn't about hearing the word in such a way that you'll be changed or you desire to be changed. It's just kind of self-serving and self-reliance. The seed on the path that falls and is quickly taken away. Then Jesus addresses another kind of soil. We'll call it the rocks in verse 6 and 13. Verse 6, Jesus says, And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Okay, you can see that. Okay, rocky ground, the seed gets in, maybe it goes between the rocks. A little bit, maybe starts to grow up a little bit, but if the rain comes, it's probably not getting in there, it's not getting any sunlight, it's not growing, and it withers away. He interprets it in verse 13. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they heard the word, receive it with joy, right? Oh, it's going to take some root. But they have no root. It's not getting sunlight, it's not getting rain, it's not getting nurtured. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. It says, these are those who hear and receive it with joy, an outward emotion. This, this makes me feel good. This is awesome stuff. These are professed believers. Those who may be sitting here today, and you say, well, I'm a believer. But when trials and tests come, you realize you're shallow and weak. You know, emotions alone aren't a bad thing but they are not a sure sign of affection for Christ. There's a danger in giving credence to immediate responses and quick belief. Oh, that sounds good. That'll, that, 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 that'll change my life. I need, to, I need to run to the front and get some of that. Quick results are not always real. It is over time, I believe, that you can know the deep and complete work of Christ in you. Yes, there is often immediate and profound changes in the life of someone who gives their life to Christ, right? There are immediate, profound changes, but we see in these verses the importance of testing and hard times in a person's life. Now, let me just be real for a second. If you're here and you're just trying to find the truth, let me give you a hard truth. Knowing Jesus will not solve all your problems. Knowing Jesus will not make life easier. Knowing Jesus doesn't take you from a zero to a 10. It doesn't fix everything. What it does is it changes the way that you deal with all the stuff that happens in life. If you've accepted a gospel of any less than tells you that what Jesus does, what the gospel does, is give you a different perspective, gives you the Holy Spirit to be able to deal with the issues of life, allows you to push through hard times because you know someone bigger than the hard times, then you've accepted an incorrect gospel. It's one thing to trust Jesus when all is well and amazing. It's quite another when hard times hit and life is hard and your faith is truly tested. Time is an excellent clarifier. I say this all the time. that you know I know new believers, and, and uh, I joke with them about it. You know, you, you, you meet a new believer, and maybe you are, and all your prayers get answered, Right? Like, Pastor Brian, I was praying the other day, and I was praying this, and I said, God, I, could you do, oh, and it happened, like that fast. And, and everything I prayed about just keeps happening. I, I asked for this, and this happens, and I asked God for this in this situation, and this happens, and all these prayers start getting answered. What's God teaching that person? 
that he answers prayer, right? Now, some of you have been a believer a while. Do prayers get answered quite that fast for you? No. What's going on? Well, because the lesson is different. See, it's not Christianity 101 anymore. It's Christianity 401. And the lesson is now not Jesus answers prayer, but let me teach you some trust and faith. See, because if God just kept doing that, what would happen? We would think that God's a giant gumball machine. And we put in, well, when I was growing up, it was a penny, everybody. Now it's a quarter. What's up with that? God isn't a giant, God, God doesn't work that way. Yes, does he answer prayers? Yes. But sometimes he says, hey, you know what? The answer is wait. And sometimes he even says the answer is no. But are you still going to trust me? You see, the lessons change. God, take this trial from me. No, the trial's going to make you stronger. God, don't, don't let this happen. No, it's going to happen because you're going to be more like me on the other side of this. Time is an excellent clarifier. You see, we could have looked at that that seed that went into that soil and the rocks and we said, hey, look, it's growing. But it wouldn't last, would it? There can be a natural excitement when you're around people just like you. You know, you come to church and you say, there are other young couples here. There are other singles. Guys, there are single girls here. How awesome is that? See, there's a natural excitement, but the question then becomes, do you enjoy being around them but not really Jesus? Are you intrigued and drawn in by the love and the care of the church but never truly bow your knee to Jesus? You see, this soil failed to hear the way it should because it didn't have strong rooting. It wasn't really about Jesus. It was about a bunch of other stuff. And when it got hard... And, and the girl you came to church for broke up with you? Well, then we, you discover what kind of root you have. When you got involved in that ministry and then somebody else was in that ministry who was just kind of hard to get along with, and you just gave up on it all, then you discover how strong the root was. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream. See, it was in a good place. It made sure that it was, you know, happy is the man who trusts in the Lord. That's like a tree that's put in the right place, and it's being able to get water, and it's being able to get light. The root that nourishes fruitful hearing is the root of faith. Hearing begets faith, and faith begets better hearing. Verse 13, where Jesus clarifies this, describes the person who thinks they have the word and true spiritual faith and joy, but they have no root to sustain themselves in time of trouble. See, it's superficial enthusiasm that is only real on fair weather days. And so when trial comes, what they think they have is taken away. Maybe your belief in Jesus is for the perks of the faith, but not the perils. There is good stuff about knowing Jesus, but it also has its perils. Maybe you're drawn to the prosperity gospel, that as long as you have a good life, as long as life is good, God's okay. As long as life is good, God is good. This is the person that makes no real change in their life, but keeps the rocks in the ground. You see, this is, maybe you're sitting here and, yeah, I want to know Jesus, and I kind of like this, this Jesus thing, and yeah, I, I come to church every week, so that makes me a believer. No. You see, what starts happening? Well, obedience or disobedience starts showing up. No real life changes. You see, this is the one that didn't pitch the porn and stop gossiping and treating others cruelly and playing favorites that hang on to our favorite sins. But at church, they hide it all. This is the seed in the rocks that never really takes root. In verse 7, Jesus brings to the story another kind of soil. That that is among their thorns in the soil. 
Maybe in our culture today, we would say this is crabgrass that we can't seem to get out of our yard. Jesus says, some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. Verse 14, as for what fell on the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. See, this is the person who hears and receives, but there's no good fruit. This is a hearing where worries, the cares of life, but also, look, the riches and the pleasures choke out the word. They think they have the word of God, but when the worries and riches and pleasures of life come, what they think they have is taken away, and they fail to bear fruit. The text makes it seem that there is either too much good or too much bad that leads them away. They make a decision to follow Christ somewhere in life, but never followed through on the lifelong commitment part. The newness passes away, and the familiar calls back, doesn't it? I mean, let's face it. For many of us, we've been around the, we were around the world far longer than we've been around Jesus. This familiarity with sin will never truly go away. I understand that. It's very, but it's very easy to mix the two. And then what we make is this conglomeration of church and worldly living, of following Jesus but living how we want to with no change. And this is a very dangerous place to be spiritually. You see, even your own assumption that because of a prayer that you prayed or membership in a church or even a good reputation that you're a follower of Jesus. See, how many of us sit here each week and we're not really Jesus followers, but people think we are because we look the part Matthew 7, one of the most depressing (laughs) sections of Scripture says this. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? Do many mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Look at what they're doing. Good, churchy things. I mean, probably more than some of us. Prophesying, casting out demons, doing mighty works. I never knew you. Because the pleasures of life or the cares of life choked out the reality of the relationship. The seed that gets into the soil that's taken over by thorns. Then he gets to the fourth. Soil, the good soil. And just mark there next to that, this is where I want to be, if there was any doubt, okay? Verse 8, and some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. Verse 15, as for that in the good soil, they are those who hearing the word, okay? Everybody's hearing it, another hearer, they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. The good soil represents people who respond to his message, it says, with a honest and good heart. Now, this doesn't mean that you are righteous, because if you were, you wouldn't need Jesus' forgiveness, right? So that's not what it means. It means, rather, that you're honest about your need for Jesus' message, that you are humble and deeply aware of your need. You agree that you've rebelled against God and are guilty before him. You admit that you are incompetent to direct your own life. So when you hear this message that Jesus can forgive and guide you reliably through life, you respond by giving yourself to Jesus as your forgiver and your guide. This is a good soil. If you have spiritual ears, then you will be given understanding. Your desire is to hear, and then as growth takes place, you can start to see it. You see, it doesn't, it doesn't start to wither. It's not getting choked off. It's growing up. We can look at a field and see that, can't we? 
we can look at our own life and see that. You continue to live in loving obedience to Jesus as you grow. And the outcome, it says, is a hundredfold. I don't know specifically what this means, but there's this idea that a hundred times the amount of spiritual fruit is produced because you're someone truly transformed by the gospel. Now, let me just warn you. If you're not seeing fruit, like a lot of it, you need to evaluate which soil you are. Because this is the promise, is it not in this passage? That the person who truly knows Jesus, who has truly been transformed by the gospel, that there will be all this fruit. There will be things in our life that we see and that are very obvious that God is doing through us. You know who you are and who you were because of Jesus. And while you're not perfect or sinless, you're continuing to be used by God for his glory. This soil has nothing to hold back. There is no shallowness to it. There is nothing out to get it. No weeds. This soil will go deep and allow the person to gain a a firm foundation that will withstand sun and drought and the trials of life. And it grows over time with the truth of the gospel. It's nourished. It's continually nourished and fertilized by prayer and study of the word and acts of faith and the fellowship of the body and self-discipline and obedience to the clear teaching of Scripture. This is the person that shows a life of repentance and sensitivity to sin in their life. See, these are people that maybe you look at and you say, there is nothing, no trouble in this world is going to shake them. You see, that's because they didn't build their faith on their own righteousness, their good feelings, or their own good deeds. They're in good soil. Now look what we discover. Three out of the four hearings are not redeeming. Hearing is not enough. Obedience with good fruit is the point. So those are the soils. Why is it important how you hear the word of God? Verse 16 and 17. No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. What is Jesus saying? There is no reason to take in God's word and do nothing with it. Jesus declares that the fruit of hearing the gospel, the the fruit of this good soil is a life that shines in the world so that people who are coming into Jesus, who are coming into this place, may see and know the way to enter. When your lamp is lit by the word of God and your life becomes a life of faith, and joy and good deeds, you won't hide it. It won't be hidden. See, why are people outside the church constantly saying that it's filled with hypocrites? Because it is. It is filled with people who are the other three soils, whose life doesn't match what we say we believe. Because maybe we haven't truly been changed by the gospel. What they need to see is a church full of good, dirty people. They need to see a church filled with people who have have a soil that the, the gospel is constantly changing and constantly growing and is growing up in a fruitful way so that when we come in and they say, that must be real. And they see Jesus too. So as we finish this morning, at the bottom of your your outline is a self-evaluation soil test. Okay? First of all, what kind of dirt are you? What kind of hearer are you? Which soil is God saying right now, this is you? Second, how do I prepare to hear the word of God taught and preached? 
How do I prepare? Do, how do I prepare for a Sunday morning? See, the, if we use the words from this passage, how do I take heed what I hear? How do I do this? Now, I want to quickly give you, uh, oh, 14 things. No, I'm not going to give you 14 things. Five or six things. Pray for a good and honest heart to hear before you come. Just ask God for a good and honest heart to hear. Spend time before you come into this building asking God for spiritual ears. Now, what would this mean for some of us? Well, it would mean getting to bed at a decent time on Saturday night. And it would mean getting up a little early. How many of us are completely rushed in the mornings? Right? Completely rushed. Up at the last, you know, some of us calculate what time we're going to be here, and we back it up to 14 minutes earlier. Well, this is mostly guys. Ladies, I don't know how you work, but anyway. <laughs> guys are 14 minutes, and they, okay, let's plan this out, because I've got to get there at this point, and we just rush it all morning. Give yourself time to spend before you come into this building. Two, meditate on the Word of God throughout the week, so that a hunger is stirred up in you. Psalm 19 says that it's this kind of hunger, it's to be desired more than gold. Meditate on the Word of God. Three, be physically ready. I mentioned this a minute ago. Don't be, re you know, be rested, not rushed. You know, what are we when we don't have sufficient rest? We're not alert, our minds are dull, our emotions are flat and unenergetic, our, we're susceptible to depression, our fuses are shorter. Probably be good to be physically ready to hear the Word of God. Number four, stay away from controversy and quarreling before you come to church. Now, I know this isn't a problem for any of you. When there is something that you're angry about or some conflict that genuinely you think needs to be talked about, here's my suggestion. Hang in there and put it off till after worship. It will not be solved in the car on the way. Not in a helpful way. And my guess is, many of the times, once you come and you take in the word, you'll get back in the car and forget what it even was. Because it really wasn't important. Don't let that get in the way of preparing to hear the word of God. Number five, stay, uh, be here early so that you can quietly focus your mind's attention and your heart's affections. Be here early. Follow Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. And the last one, stay till the very end. Don't let anything else, not appointments, not lunch, whatever, get in the way of what you need to hear. If you rush out in order to get to an appointment or be the first in line at the buffet or even to just beat the crowds in the children's wing... You're missing out on God's complete word to you. I'm convinced that sometimes if you walk out early, the very thing God had for you to complete his word for you that day happened after you left. So I would challenge you to try it and prove me correct. Three, one, uh, two more questions. How do I tend to listen to the word of God? First one is, what kind of dirt am I? How do I prepare for the word of God in my life and to be preached? How do I tend to listen to the word of God? Do, I, do you come with a spirit of teachability? Not to be impressed or to feel good, but to be impacted and changed. Not just because this is what you do on Sunday. And then uh, the last one, how do I usually respond to the truth I hear? I heard it said that the way to grow is to obey what you know. Now at the very end of this section in Luke 8.21, we see this, Jesus say this, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying that those of us who hear his word and obey, we are his family his spiritual sons and daughters, his brothers and sisters. It's ultimately proven out. The truth of what kind of soil you are shows up in your obedience to the gospel. It's ongoing work in your life, and Jesus calls you family. We want to be hearers and doers of the word of God. God, take your word today and use it. 
God, I pray that uh, the seed of truth today would be uh, placed in good soil. Father, I'd pray against the enemy who would come to steal it. I'd pray against those who are struggling to hear truth. God, that the cares of life wouldn't take over. God, give us ears to hear in this place today.